An aspiring rapper gives his all to achieve his dream. He had already accomplished a whole lot, performing and opening up for, you know, Ludacris. I make more money and I'm more weak than I'm more make all their life. But the music stops when shots ring out. She's hard to understand. She is screaming. He's dead on the floor with gunshot wounds. That's when I was like, this can't be real. The gruesome crime scene challenges investigators to question every detail before them. It was a dangerous crowd that he ran with. We don't have enough evidence at this point to tell the story. Let's keep going. You never know what's going to turn up and help us out. Then when the curtain finally closes on this investigation, a calculated killer will step into the spotlight. I told them that they need to find a cell phone. If he was doing anything, it was recorded on that cell phone. I kept thinking, this is a movie, but it was real. It was horrific. It, it was horrible. Look at this knife. Y'all see this Right. Y'all see how this This is manipulative behavior of a murderer. So how did he get shot in the head? I don't know. I just know I was trying to get away. I've seen a lot of evil in my career, but I've never seen evil document itself like that. I said, bro, you dancing with the devil. December 29th, 2017. It's 10.50 p.m. in Clayton County, Georgia, as a call breaks the silence of the 911 dispatch center. There was a 911 call that was placed by a neighbor. Sierra Harp had knocked on uh, her neighbor's door uh, kind of frantically. She was holding her three-year-old daughter, Angel, the neighbor can tell, number one, that she's been stabbed multiple times. Number two, that she's been stabbed seriously. When police arrive, they quickly encounter the victim, 28-year-old Sierra Harp. She was hysterical. No one could understand what she was saying, and she was bleeding heavily. Her neighbor, who called 911, tells police that Sierra lives in a nearby apartment with her child's father, Raheem Grant. The neighbor had kind of gotten a little bit of information about that there had been a domestic, but she had no idea where Rahim was. And so the neighbor actually locked the door behind them because she was concerned that Rahim was going to come after Sierra in some way, shape, or form. Officers cautiously make their way to Sierra's apartment to find Rahim. They were able to um, walk through the front door. They made a turn to the left. And that's where they were first confronted with Raheem's body. Most of the bottom of his body was in the bathroom, and then the top portion of his body was laying face down in the bedroom. Officers were able to observe at least three bullet wounds, two in his back and one in his head. Police realized pretty quickly that, that he was not alive when they got there. With an apparent homicide and an injured victim on their hands, first responders quickly called detectives to the scene. In the bathroom, bedroom area, they see that the mirror had been pierced by a bullet. Uh, there were perforations in the wall. There was a lot of blood on the wall. They found seven shell casings. Uh, they found a few around his body, and then one was actually on the bed. Detectives find a driver's license and are able to confirm that the deceased is Raheem Grant. The key piece of evidence in, in the investigation is victimology. It's what brought the victim into this circumstance, trying to learn, you know, is there some type of history for all the parties that we have involved? Who are the people that were in this location? The victim always has something to say, even after they're in the grave. The 911 call was made by a downstairs neighbor of Sierra Harps. Uh, after everything had happened, she picked up her three-year-old daughter and fled to this neighbor's house, I'm sorry, the neighbor's apartment, and knocked on the door. And she's standing there holding a baby, and she has blood all over her. And she told the neighbor that there was a, something that had happened in her apartment, and she needed to come in, and she needed to call the police. They're going to take a look, and they're going to seal that crime scene down. They're going to photograph it. And the best piece of evidence they got, they have at this moment, is Raheem's body. 
That's always the key piece of evidence in any homicide investigation is, is the victim's body. So that's gonna be photographed from multiple angles, multiple shots, wide angles, close up angles, so forth, things like that. Then they're going to photograph the shell casings. They're gonna measure where those shell casings are from what they call a baseline. And they'll figure out where the gun was in relation to the body and things like that. They're gonna photograph um, other areas of the house. Um, and thankfully they did. Um, the one big box that was left to be checked off was how do we get into Raheem's phone? Because you know, well, detectives can get a search warrant, but it's not always necessarily going to happen that we can get into that phone. So this was actually rather crafty detective work on the, the part of the Clayton County Police Department. She was not, Sierra was not a suspect. At this point, she was a witness. So the detectives actually called Sierra up and said, hey, we're about ready to close this case. The one thing that's left to remain though, we'd like to get into Raheem's phone and see if there's any further evidence that we need, but there's a passcode on it. Do you happen to know what that passcode is? And she gave them the passcode to get into the phone. Well, the first image on the first video is Raheem's bloody face. So that's, that's the first thing he looks at. And the first video is Raheem talking to his phone. And he says, y'all see this? This is what that bitch Sierra Harp did to me. And it's his bloody face. And you can hear Sierra yelling in the background. She's yelling, really Raheem? Really? And he's saying, you see this? I, I think it, the moment that she snapped was when she realized she, he's videotaping this. He's going to, he gets to play this over and over and over and that's it. I'm, I'm not gonna let him do this to me. I'll show him. That's when she went out and picked the gun up and she, she took over his position of power. And then she realized, now I'm in the power of position that I've always sought. Now you're on the ground and you're begging me to help you. And that's what she had wanted from Raheem. And she took advantage of that power position. And she shot him five more times, ultimately killing him. At that point, she realized that she needed, now, now she's killed a guy. Now she's got to cover it up and make it look like she didn't cold blooded kill him like she just did. And that's when she got to stabbing herself. When she stabbed herself in the legs, came up with this entire story that he had attacked her. She picks her daughter up, walks down the steps to the neighbor's, to the neighbor's apartment, throws the knife away as she's doing it. And that's when she tells the neighbor, call the police, he attacked me. She, if she needed help, she had a loving mother right up until she went on trial. Her mother would have been there to help her. Her, um, her, she had a brother, she had a sister, she had family in the area. She had friends that she could have gone to, but she chose the life of, you know, she wanted to be a rap star's girlfriend. That's what she wanted. She did not want help. She wanted the fame. I do feel justice was served for Raheem. Um, it was, Sierra ended up being convicted on all counts and she was sentenced to 125 years to serve. Uh, there was, I know that a lot of people will say, well, why wasn't she uh, sentenced to life in prison? She could always get out after 125 years. She's not getting out. She's not going to get out. Um, there was, due to sentencing guidelines, she was maxed out on every charge that she, that she was convicted of. She received the ultimate, the ultimate charge, or the ultimate sentence that she could have. The only other thing that I remember is Sierra Harp herself testified. Um, and during the course of her testimony, she never shed a tear. She never seemed sorry. She never seemed sad, nothing. It was the same affect that she gave to police in the second interview. It was cold. It was as though the trial was an inconvenience to her. The only time that she cried was during sentencing in front of the judge. Um, and she cried to the judge and she said that she was an abuse victim um, and that she didn't want to go to prison for long. You know, it's not just justice for Raheem, it's justice for Angel. It's, it's justice for Geraldine. Um, you know, Angel was robbed of her mother and her father in one night. And I don't know how much of a mother Sierra was, but she did recognize her as her mother. Um, you know, what 
what Raheem had to go through, he went through that night. And, and that's over for him. But this will be with Angel for the rest of her life. I just don't know if there's any amount of justice that that can be implemented. He didn't deserve to die. You know, I don't think nobody, I, you know, I don't wish death on nobody because you can't come back from it. There's no coming back. There's no, there's no point of return after that. But the way he died was very much so wrong. I think the way we should remember Raheem as a, a person, with a young man with a lot of potential that he did not get to reach, you know, as somebody who was a loving father, who's stepping up to the plate as a father, you know, and, you know, regardless of, of the defense theories or what happened in the past, you know, Raheem had a chance for a bright future that he did not get a chance to see, and that is a tragedy. So we all regret that. We don't know what impact he would have had on Angel um, for, you know, really pushing her through school, becoming a father figure, making her become, you know, a, a pillar of society. We don't know what would happen. And, and sometimes that's, that's the biggest tragedy, is the, the not knowing. Uh, my motivation for speaking about Raheem today is just to enlighten the world on how good of a person that he was, how respectful he was, how caring he was for that little girl. And I'll always have her in my mind and in my heart um, for her having to have seen such a tragic moment at such a young age. Raheem had a great future and his daughter is the one that is really having to deal with the pain like me and we go through this pain together and I don't know when she get big what it's gonna how it's gonna affect her or what she's gonna do but I tried to keep her close. I think Raheem should be remembered as uh, someone who if he was a book we never got the chance to read that book to the end. We never got a chance to get to the conclusion and see how uh, his rap career would have ended, how high he would have gone, how low he would have gone. We never got to see him reach his full potential. And more importantly, we never got to see him age and become an even better dad. We never got to see that. And even more importantly, we never got to see that little girl uh, get to walk down the aisle with her father, get to him to get to see her graduate or do great things. That little girl has lost a mother and lost a father, and that is just heartbreaking. Well, my son, Raheem. Raheem was one of a kind. When he was born, he was always into exploring different things. Um, he was very smart. He always had a great memory. He could remember your phone number. A lot of times we would laugh because like if you give him your phone number, he will call you back. He's been into entertainment ever since he was like three and a half years old. Yes, he um, started doing the drums and then he went from there on the microphone. And then when I did a TV show, he wanted to be the educational rapper. And that's when I started to um, work with him in the business of entertainment. Where he became a teenager, and he was like, you know what, I think I want to change from being the educational rapper to being a gangster rapper. I'm like, oh, uh, uh, no, no, we, we, we're not going to talk about it. I don't think we want to do that. And then he was like, well, I, I really do. I want to change uh, and be a gangster rapper because he know he couldn't do that when he was younger. But once he became, um, I think up in the, his teens and got legitim, legitimate, as they say, a legitimate age, he decided then that he wanted to be um, an edu um, gangster rapper. And um, that's what we started, he started doing on his own with me as his manager, and I always helped him with his career. Sierra was never crazy. She was always a person that thought out carefully what she did. Even when, before I knew she was doing what she was doing, I was around her. She would always think about doing this, think about doing that. She would write down what she would do. So it wasn't like she was just crazy, and that's what everybody wanted to make it seem like she was crazy. No, she's very, very intelligent. That morning, somebody came banging on my door. 
and I think it was like maybe six o'clock, and it was the police office officer, because there was banging, 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 and then I look out my window, and it was Clayton County, and I'm like, okay, why is Clayton County here? I'm in Fayetteville. Why is Clayton County here? And the first thing came on my mind was loud music. Uh, Raheem, uh, that was the first thing. And then it was like, okay, but the police is here. Has he gotten shot? Has he gotten into some trouble? I said, well, go ahead and tell me. I said, what has Raheem done now? I said, you all got him, I'll be down to get him. And they was like, no, he's been murdered. Well, no, not murdered. He's been shot, he's dead. At that time, it hit me. And then that's when I was like, you know, this can't be real. What's happening? Who shot him? Why is he dead? I couldn't believe it. It was like I was in another world, out of body experience, where you didn't know how to think and why are they playing this joke on me? That's what it was.